Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Remember me. Samson versus the thief. Hmm. Uh, it's it's going to be a long study, so we're going to jump right into it. Please turn to Judges 16, verse 21. Judges 16, verses 21. We're going to get into this thing about remember me. It's all through the Bible. Different people are doing it through the Bible, and I thought... I was praying with the Lord, and He showed me some things in God in His Word, and said, "Hey, here's some comparisons between people who are saying, "Remember me." Here's comparison between people one saying, "Remember me," and the other one's not." Okay? So I'm going to do a series of studies for a while with the Lord's blessing. Uh, remember me, and the whole thing about it, brothers of Christ, when we get into these studies, when you see someone saying, "Remember me," to the Lord, what they're doing is they're humbling themselves. When they say, "Remember me," they humble themselves. And they're actually remembering who God is before they say, remember me. It just comes naturally when you humble yourself and you fall on your knees before the Lord and say, remember me. You're humbling yourself. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But Judges 16, 21. But the Philistines took him. This is Samson. Okay, remember Samson's with Delilah and his pride and his ego and he's playing around and Delilah's like you keep lying to me she's asking him where does thy strength lie where does thy strength lie and he finally told the truth that it was his hair so they cut his hair and then she says the Philistines be upon thee Samson and he gets up and goes out as other times not knowing that his strength has left him and the Philistines are able to take him and this is where we're at Judges 16 21 but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes okay. Now, if you read the whole story, if you want to pause this and read the story about Samson again, read the story about Samson. He was very prideful. He was a sinner. Okay, The corpse, one of the things I was taught was the corpse of the lion. When Samson killed the lion and came back and there was honey and bees, a beehive, in the corpse of the lion and he took the honey, he touched a dead corpse. He was supposed to be unclean for so long, according to the scriptures. He didn't tell his parents where it came from. He dishonored his parents. Okay, He was messing with strange wives. Right? Samson was a sinner. And he was very prideful. Okay? And in a lot of ways, he was very prideful. He was doing the work of the Lord. God was still using him. I'm not saying Samson was just some horrible guy. I just want people to understand. Cause some people put Samson up on a pillar like he's some great, great hero of the faith. He had problems. He was a sinner and he had problems, and he had pride problems. Now look what we just saw here. It says, and they put out his eyes. What does it take to humble a man? I gave warning to some of the brethren out there that I saw that their pride was getting out of control. What does it take to humble a man? What has God got to do to humble you? Well, let's look at what Paul, uh, God did to Samson to humble him. And put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass. He's a prisoner in chains. And he did grind in the prison house. Grind. They put him to work. He was a slave. He had no more rights, no more freedoms. He lost everything. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. 23, then the Lord, here's something I found very interesting. Then the Lord to the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. For they said, our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. No, God did. Brian, uh, how do I say it? Uh, Samson, through his pride, God delivered him to the Philistines. Oh, yeah. But they're trying to claim their God did it. Their God did it. Let's see how they're, what's going to happen to them. Samson, our enemy, is into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God hath delivered unto our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. Remember, God used Samson, despite his flaws, despite his sins, to be a thorn in the Philistines' side. And part of this, I believe, is because the Philistines were coming down hard. Remember, they were in captivity at the time, the, some of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish people there, that they were distracted by Samson. And they weren't going after the Jews hardcore. They were going after Samson. God used him as a distraction to be a thorn in the Philistines' side. And here we see what they, he did. 
Okay. He, he destroyed a lot of them. Verse 25. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, they were getting drunk, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him, that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth. Now stop there. Someone had to guide him and lead him around? Another thing about humbling. Someone has to guide him. He can't see. Right? That I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistine were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. Now we see these people are wicked, vile people. They worship false gods, and they attack the one true God. And they're, and they're getting drunk, and there's no telling what other kinds of sins, but they're just very wicked people. It's very important to remember. And Samson called upon, called unto the Lord, and said, O Lord God, remember me. But what did he do first? He called upon the Lord. He remembered the Lord. He was humbled. He was broken. Remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one which his right of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, here's the key part, first one remember me. He knows he's looking up to God, humbling himself, and he has to humble himself to say, Lord, remember me and go to God in a, in a right state, a humble state. Remember me. Second thing he says here is, let me die with the Philistines. We'll come back to that in just a second. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the Lord's and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew in his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Those people, oh, I'll, uh, our God brought Samson in our hands. We've overcome, they're acting like we overcome the God of, of the Jews. No, 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 no. And God put them in their place. He used Samson one more time. But, but we're going to get back to his statement about, let me die with the Philistines. Then his brethren and all the house of his fathers came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zohar and Zithral, and the bearing place of Manoah, his father. And he judged Israel twenty years. Okay, Samson was broken. He dropped his pride in his ego. Read about it. He has a little bit of an ego. He dropped his pride and his ego. He has alley ice put out. He's being mocked. He's a slave. He's in chains. He has to be led around. Talk about humbling. That humbles you. But he said, remember me. And then he th said the key part there is, let me die with them. Now, I'm not trying to add to God's word, but when he says, let me die with them, I deserve to die with them. Lord, when you get to that point where you say, I deserve to die, for this is Christ, then God can use you. That's when God can save somebody. When you come to him fully broken to the point where you say, I deserve to die and go to hell. I deserve to die. Okay? These people are wicked. I believe what Samson's saying here is, let me die with them. I deserve to die with them, O Lord. I deserve to die with them. Right? We're going to see this parallel with the thief when we get to the thief. And you'll understand a little bit more with the parallel. Okay. Samson deserved to die with those people for the wickedness he did. For the pride. Okay. He deserved it. Jesus Christ, our Savior chose to die with the wicked men that were on the cross with him. We'll get to the thief on the cross. Okay? But what is this thing about the eyes, what I mean by the humbling of the eyes? Turn to Acts chapter 9. Was somebody else humbled by having their eyesight taken away? Mm -hmm. How many know this story? Mm -hmm. 
Acts 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters, letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined, shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell on the earth, humbling. He's going through a humbling experience. But that wasn't enough. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He was taking the, the body of Christ, the, the church, people, and throwing them in prison and killing them. But God doesn't say, why are you persecuting my people? He's saying, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And notice that's a capital Lord and it's a question mark. Who art thou, Lord? Ah, uh -uh, the light shining. He's starting to get it. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth and when his and when his eyes were opened he saw no man he was blind he had to be led around but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus and he was three days without sight and neither did eat nor drink being led around that's humbling God will do things to humble you why because you can get to the point where you say remember me and, and remember, saying, remember me, Paul remembered who the Lord was. Who art thou? Lord? It's starting to come to him because he was humbled. And he sits there, and you read the whole story, that God sends someone to preach the gospel to Paul, to preach Jesus Christ to Paul, to heal him so he could see again. Mm -hmm. Brothers, this is Christ from the Bible. When we see there about Samson, I believe Samson was humbled remember me now this is a salvation for today but back then remember me Lord and I deserve to die with these people I deserve to die I deserve for today would be like I deserve to die I deserve to go to hell and burn for all eternity Lord I deserve it I don't deserve to go to heaven Lord I don't deserve your mercy or your grace Lord Lord be merciful to me a sinner that's true biblical repentance I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, worthy of death, worthy of hell. I don't want to go to hell, Lord, but I deserve it. Okay. It's very important. Okay. There's an old hymn that the Lord gave me. It's, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry, whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, whilst on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Remember me, O Lord. Now you say, well, how does this have to, anything to do with the dying thief? Well, let's get to the story of the dying thief. Let's start comparing what happened to Samson, what happened to the dying thief on the cross. There's two of them that we're going to be looking at. Okay? And Jesus Christ. Turn to Luke 23. Luke 23, 35. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. This is Jesus on the cross, 
okay? They've whipped him within an inch of his life. They've ripped his beard out. They've spit in his face. They've buffeted him in the face. They're mocking him. And here's the hard part about the brethren. We understand, but some in the world just doesn't get. A lot of those people that were doing this to him, that were mocking him and yelling at him, a week earlier they were praising him. Oh, I'm your friend. I love him. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Now they're screaming, crucify him. All right. So I want to bring that out. Let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God, and the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in, in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. That's what's holding the three up there. Hebrew, or Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. In verse 39 it says, And one of the malefactors, now we're going to stop there, we're going to come back, but one of the malefactors, you don't have to turn here, but Isaiah 53, 12 says, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sins of many, and made an intercession for the transgressors. Stop there for a second. I understand some people say, well, that's everybody. He made intercession for both of those thieves on the cross. Remember that. And we're going to see what happened to the two thieves on the cross. But he was numbered with the transgressors. He was going to die with sinners. He's dying with people who deserve to die. Samson's like, let me die with them. I deserve to die. Jesus did not deserve to die. He was innocent. Samson wasn't innocent. But we see a similarity here. He was numbered with the transgressors. He was dying with sinners. He wasn't a sinner, but they were. Mark 15, 27 says, And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scriptures was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Remember Samson, let me die with them. I deserve his eye with these Philistines. Let me die with them. Okay, Samson deserved to die with those Philistines. And he did. And God used them one last time. Jesus chose to die for our sins, brothers and sisters in Christ. He chose Remember when he's in the garden? When he's in the garden praying, he's saying, Lord, if it be possible, take this cup from me. He's not saying he doesn't want to die. He was letting us know, through the scriptures, he was letting us know there is no other way. The only way for God to save us is to sacrifice his son on the cross, and he did it. Mm -hmm. turn to, uh, go back to Luke 23, 35, if you're still there, if you didn't turn anywhere, but... Sometimes you pause the videos and turn. But Luke 23, and one of the malefactors, okay, there's two thieves on the cross with him. One of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. He is. That thief doesn't get it, but he is saving them. Let's keep going. Verse 40. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Dost thou not fear God? This thief is humbling himself. And as we're going to catch on, he wasn't this way at the beginning. This thief is humbling himself. We did a study on this way in the past about the, the, the uh, thief on the dying cross repent. He started out, we're going to read this, he started out railing on Jesus also, mocking him. But after a while, he saw the predicament that he was in, the wicked sinner that he was, and dost thou not fear God? He humbled himself and started fearing God, and he repented. He started defending Jesus. Dost thou not fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. In other words, we are sinful, wicked men. We deserve to die here on this cross. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto, the, unto Jesus, Lord, remember me. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. 
Dost thou not fear God? We are in the same condemnation. Samson was humbled. He was broken. He had his eyes taken out. He was put in chains. He was a slave. He had to be led about. He was humble. And he remembered God. Okay? Let me die with them. And he said, remember me, O Lord. We see here, he's telling Lord, right there in the, in the likeness of sinful flesh, remember me. Matthew 21, 42. Turn to Matthew 21, 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye not read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now, the two thieves that were on the cross with him, he was being crucified by Romans, and those two thieves, it doesn't say who they were, but it doesn't say they were Jews. He was there to say salvation was going out into the world. Okay. Be taken from you. 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone, talking about Jesus Christ, coming to the cross broken, not prideful, not full of yourself, not loving your sin and loving the world, being fed up of the world, being fed up of your wickedness and your sin, saying, I'm ready to die and I deserve to die. And go to hell and burn for all of forever, Lord. I am just worthless. You come to the Lord broken. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And we're going to come back to this. But Luke 20, 17 says, And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Who shall, ever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. That's the parallel verse. Remember what I said, if something's said more than once, it's usually because it's very important. Even if it's said once, it's important. But if it's said more than once, it's important. Okay? Now, both thieves on the cross railed on him. Matthew 27. Turn to Matthew 27, 38. Because some people don't teach this, and they don't realize this. Mm -hmm. They think that one thief was against him, and one thief was for him from the very beginning. Not so. Okay. Matthew 27, verse 38. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on his right hand, one on the other, let's see, and one and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him. Remember the same people that were saying, Hosea in the highest. They go by, they're reviling him. Wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Uh, he's saving others even to the very end. He saved the one thief. If he be king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. And here's the key verse. I want to realize to show that they're all mocking, they're all doing all these things, mocking and mocking him. Verse 44, the thieves, plural, also. Now we start at the beginning, he says, then there were two thieves crucified with him. So this isn't talking about a thief in the crowd or something, and all that nonsense that people will try to do everything they can to get out of this repentance, coming broken before the Lord. The thieves also. We started, when we started reading at 38, it started with the thieves. Verse 44, it's ending with the thieves. The thieves also which were crucified with him. It's so crystal clear. Crucified with him. 
cast the same in his teeth. They cast the same in his teeth. Well, what happened, brothers of Christ? You have a perfect example of how God deals with people in this life, in the church age. He will break everyone at one point in your life. You had to become broken. Fully and completely broken. One of the thieves, he was grounded to powder. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. One of the thieves, on whom it shall fall, he shall be broken. Why do we get broken? So that God can make us whole. And only God can make us whole. The thief that, said, that had a change, you say a change of heart, that repented, that humbled himself, said we deserve to die, he feared God, we deserve to die. Lord, remember me. Now that thief didn't go straight to heaven, he went down to Abraham's bosom. This day you'll be with me in paradise. He's talking about Abraham's bosom. Okay? But the point is, brother and sister Christ, it takes humbleness. When God goes to save someone, it takes being broken, being humble. When you come down and say, Lord, remember me. Brother and sister Christ, even in our life as a Christian, we'll do another teaching showing some other things. More for, this is more for salvation is what I'm doing this for. When you've realized that you've screwed up royally, you're not following God, you're not fearing God, uh, you need to get saved. You need to get born again. But there's times even in your life as a Christian that you tend to lose sight of God and you take your eyes off God and put it on the world and you need to come back to God and say, God, remember me. And that's you putting your eyes back on God. One became broken while the other was ground into powder. Samson was very prideful. Pride cost him strength. His eyes cost him everything. But he humbled himself. Lord, remember me. Lord, let me die with them. I deserve to die with them. Remember me. Second mm -hmm. Chronicles 7.14 Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people, which are called by my name, what are we called today? Christians. I know some people still have a problem with that word Christian, but I hope they pray they get over it someday. But if my people, which are called by my name, we are called Christians today. We are called saints. We are called brethren. We're called the church of God. We're the body of Christ. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Brother says Christ, before God will save you today, you have to humble yourself. You have to humble yourself, and I, you know this, brother, this is Christ, but I, I'm talking to anybody who professes to be a Christian. If you, ha if you never came to God broken, we're going to talk about you. If you came to God broken and you're part of the falling away, we're going to talk about you here in a second. But those of us who are truly saved and born again, we have testimonies where we came broken before the Lord. Okay? You have to humble yourself before you come to the cross. If you didn't humble yourself before you come to the cross, that belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross is just up here. You're just part of a club. You're just trying to get a little card, insurance card to justify wickedness and sin. If you don't come to God and humble yourself, someone who truly gets saved, they come and shall humble themselves and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Then they pray and beg God to save them. And God saves them. And after they get saved, what do they do? They seek my face. They seek his face. They keep their, that looking for that blessed hope. You're looking for Jesus Christ with the life that you're living. 
brothers and sisters of Christ, we're living for Jesus Christ every day. We're seeking His face every day. You start the day with the Word of God. You end the day with the Word of God. You pray without ceasing. You seek to please God. And if you're seeking His face, what happens? And you're humble, and you're seeking God's face. Remember, Jesus is called the capital W Word, and then there's the lowercase w Word, which is the written Word of God. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. If you're seeking His face, and you're humble, and you're praying, and you're seeking His face, humble, you're not holding iniquity in your heart, You'll start turning from your wicked ways. God will clean up your life. It's guaranteed after salvation if you're truly saved and born again. God will start cleaning up your life and you'll start turning from your wicked ways. You'll be separate from this world. That thief started out acting like the world. Looking like the world. Samson, he was hanging out with the world. Philistines. Looking like the world. Getting prideful. God's going to pull you out of that. The thief was like them railing on and acting like everybody else. Then there was a change and he treated God differently. He treated Jesus Christ differently. He feared God and treated Jesus Christ differently. He changed. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. This is King David saying, if I hold sin in my heart, not if you sin, brother and sister Christ, we all are still sinners, even as saved sinners. But what I'm talking about is when you have a sin that you grab and you hold in your heart, and I'm not letting it go. I'd rather sacrifice brethren. I'd rather sacrifice ministry if, I'm, if you're a man in ministry. I'd rather sacrifice husband or wife, being a father or mother, whatever. For that sin that you're holding in your heart, when you go to pray to God, God will not hear you. That's the number one reason we have no false converts today, brother says Christ. They don't come to the cross broken. They're holding sins in their life saying, Lord, I'm going to come to you, but I love my sin, and I'm going to hold my sin in my heart, and I ain't letting it go. I don't, I'm not even sorry for it. I actually love it. I think there's nothing wrong with it. And they go to pray some kind of prayer, well, I believe in your death, burial, and resurrection, Lord. God's not going to hear that prayer when you hold iniquity in your heart. That thief is like, we deserve this. I'm wicked. I deserve this. Right? I love that verse because it says, If my people which are called by my name, for today, Christians, body of Christ, bride of Christ, shall humble themselves, it starts at salvation and it continues the rest of your life. You're always going to see yourself getting lifted up like your flesh and pride and ego and you're having to put the flesh down all the time to stay humble before the Lord. Paul says you're to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay. Humble yourself. That happens at salvation. You believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and you pray. And you ask God to save you. You beg God. Some of us beg God to save us. We don't deserve to be saved, Lord. Please save me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And after salvation, you start seeking His face. I remember uh, Peter Ruckman, I said this before myself, but I heard teaching from Peter Ruckman, and he said the same thing, praise the Lord. And it's like, I knew I was a wicked sinner. A dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good, wicked sinner before I got saved. But after I got saved and started seeking God's face through His Word, God showed me I was 50 times, 100 times, a million times worse than I thought I was. I was way worse of a sinner than I thought I was. God started showing me all kinds of sins in my life. I'm like, oh, that, that's a sin, Lord? Man, am I wicked. I'll get it out, Lord. It's gone. Well, that? Well, I'm supposed to be doing this and I'm not doing that? He showed me just how wicked it was. I was way worse than I ever thought I was. And brother, sister Christ, that should be your testimony too, when you got saved. And God cleaned up your life. That gets to the next part, and turn from their wicked ways. That's how you turn from your wicked ways. You humble yourself, you pray, and you seek God's face. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Well, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By he taking heed thereto according to thy words.
Now I want to point this out again. Both times Samson and the thief were saying, remember me. The thief on the cross said, remember me. They were really remembering God. Remember the thief, he's, he was cursing God, uh, mocking God, because Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. They were mocking him. And then he feared God. Right? When he got to the point where he said, remember me, he was remembering who God is. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish. Any should perish. You think I take pride in telling people that they're going to hell? Some people think I, I get pride and I get joy for telling brethren that, that uh, you might, or false brethren, false converts, that they need to truly get saved. You think I take pride and joy in having to remind brethren, like a brother in Christ that I believe is saved, I'll link him the gospel message, not because I believe he's lost, but he needs to be reminded who saved him, why he got saved, and who it is he serves, or she serves. Not this flesh, not the world, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He saved you because you needed to be saved. And what did you need to be saved from? This wicked, sinful body of flesh. Your wicked, wicked sins. Are you going to want to continue in them after salvation? No. Not for someone who's truly saved and born again. You think I take pride in this? No. Jesus, God himself says, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Brother, sister, Christ, if you actually look in all the dispensations, repentance is there. Not there like they're doing it, but the opportunity to repent. You say, well, well, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve in the garden, remember, God went to him. He knew what happened. He could have just punished him right there. Okay, your punishment's this, your punishment's that, and your punishment's this. Get out of the garden. Get out. He didn't. What did he do? He asked him, what have you done? Did you eat from the tree of the knowledge of evil? Adam could have repented, but he didn't. He blamed God, and he blamed the woman, his wife. He went to Eve. Eve could have repented, but she blamed the serpent. It's all the serpent's fault. In every dispensation, God has always expected repentance in mankind, His creation. When you've fallen away from the Lord and out of fellowship with the Lord, how do you come back? You have to repent. Period. So why is it today the false gospel of easy believism, that false gospel of only believe, and they take repentance? Why would you take repentance out? It's in every dispensation. Okay. But that's a whole other study. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. Sorrowed. Humbleness. Brokenness. Coming to the Lord as a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, and having sorrow for it. I'm sorry, Lord, that I've sinned against you. I'm sorry for my sins. You don't come to God loving your sins, hiding your sins in your heart, loving the way of the world, and then saying, I just believe in the big guy upstairs, therefore I'm saved. No, you're not. You're on your way to hell. And you've been deceived. If you skip repentance. Repentance is not works. Repentance is the change, it's a heart issue. Not a physical work issue, it's a heart issue. That you sorrow to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner. Remember, there's two types of sorrow here. Godly sorrow, and we'll get to the next one. That you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. It comes before salvation. Period. All through the Bible, before God saves someone, you have to repent. Okay. It's always been that way. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Those are the two sorrows people come to the cross with. You can come to the cross with sorrows of the world, or you come to the cross with sorrow, godly sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against, and put him on that cross. 
Or you can come with worldly sorrow saying, I love the world, I love my sin, but I'm just going to say this so I can be part of a club. I'm just going to say this to make my family happy. I'm going to say this so I can get this little card, an imaginary card that's an insurance policy that anytime someone calls me out on my sin, I can just whip that card out and say, uh-uh, uh-uh, I'm not saved by works. I'm not saved by works. Anybody that does that, I'm sorry, I, I just believe they're lost. According to the scriptures, they're lost. They're a false convert. If someone comes to me to correct me about sin and worldliness, I don't go back and pull, whip out a card and say, uh, 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 you're trying to say I'm, wor I'm saved by works. It doesn't work that way. If someone comes to me with the scriptures about sin and worldliness in my life, I'm going to get into the scriptures and start saying, okay, are these things so? Okay, I need to get them out. Salvation doesn't even come across my mind when a brother or sister in Christ is correcting me. But these false converts, these easy believism, it always comes across their mind. You correct them on their sin, their worldliness, their wickedness, and they just, they don't want to give it up, and their way of not giving it up is they just run back, they whip out that car, that insurance policy car, whoop choo I'm saved by, by God's grace, and, and therefore I can live however I want and do whatever I want. What did Paul say? Are we to sin that grace may abound? They believe you do, that's why they got that insurance card. I wish I had a card or something in my hands. It is a gospel track, but some card in their hands that's like, this is my insurance policy that I can sin that grace may abound. And Paul says, God forbids it. God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Salvation is not an insurance card that you get to hold up every time you get caught in sin and wickedness. You still need to come, you still need to be broken. You still need to be humble. Even as a Christian, someone calls you out on your sin and wickedness, you need to be humble and repent and get that sin out of your life. Now, don't get me wrong. When you get saved at the cross, if you're truly saved and born again, God saves you. You will not go to hell and burn for sinning against God. You cannot lose your salvation. It belongs to it. I know the Bible sometimes says, your salvation or my salvation, but that salvation is wrought in God and what Jesus Christ did. Okay. The God of my salvation. It's still God's salvation. Don't let people argue over stupid things like uh, twist with words. God did the saving. He saves you. The Bible says you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You keep sinning, you can make a mess of your life as a Christian. And you will still have to answer for it. And we're gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself. But the two types of sorrow that I keep, I'm sorry, but I've just been dealing with people recently. The two types of sorrow that I see in professing Christians is worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow proves, shows that there's a lot of false converts out there. They didn't come to the, to the cross broken with godly sorrow. They came to the cross with pride and with worldly sorrow and saying, I love my sin. I can't give up my sin. I can't give my life to Jesus Christ. Remember what the Bible says, the old man is dead and buried with Christ? The old man is dead and buried. In other words, you come to the cross giving God this wicked man, this wicked man that I am, Lord, I'm throwing it at the foot of the cross. I'm giving my life to you. And what does God do? He takes that life, that old man, that old woman, and he gives you a new life. What's going on? People are holding on to that old man. They're not throwing their lives at the foot of the cross. They're not coming to God broken. And I'm coming out here to do a plea with the brethren. You need to do that. The professing brethren, you need to do that. The ones playing Christian today, you need to come to the cross broken. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, after salvation... What carefulness it wrought in you. Remember what it talked about? Turn from your wicked ways. That's what's going to happen after salvation. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. God gets that sin and wickedness out of your life. He takes that sin away and then tells you how to live right. He washes your sins away. What clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. I fear God at the, at the cross, but then the Bible will teach you what things that God... There's a lot about the Bible I didn't know when I first got saved. I didn't know almost nothing. And I was a professing Christian for most of my life. I knew a lot of fables. I knew a lot of uh, Polly Want a Cracker, uh, PWC, 
just parroting what other people said, but I didn't know hardly anything about the Bible, as I thought I did. And when you read through this Bible, you start learning as a Christian, you start seeing everything that God is capable of doing to mankind, whether it's His grace or pouring out His wrath. And you start fearing God. What fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, you have a zeal for living for the Lord now. Because you truly repented and had godly sorrow for those sins and that wickedness, this wicked, vile flesh. Yea, what revenge, and all things we have, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Brothers and sisters Christ, that rock that we read about, we're going to, about whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but on whosoever it shall fall will grind into powder, that rock is Jesus Christ. And this is where I'm going to make a plea to all my all the professing brethren out there. Actually, not professing. I'm sorry. I've got to do it in the right order. To my truly saved, born again, Bible believing, God fearing men and women out there, that are in a standing position. And this is my plea for the standing position and those that are in a falling position. They're saved. They're going to go to heaven when they die, but they're in a fallen position. Who shall ever fall on this stone shall be broken. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Turn to 2 Corinthians 5.10 Of course. I'm in 1 Corinthians. I have things highlighted in my notes to go over and emphasize. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For we must all appear before the judgment of Christ. It's talking about the we there is saved sinners. For we must all appear at the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the thing done in his body according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And 1 Corinthians 3.12 it says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet as by fire. So my plea to the brothers and brother, sisters in Christ out there that are standing and that are falling flat on their face, you need to take things seriously. Especially my plea is for those that are falling flat on their face. They're starting to go the way of the world. They're starting to hold iniquity in their heart. They're starting to hold covetousness in their heart, which is idolatry. They're starting to have idols in their life, false lowercase g gods. They're starting to make a mess of their life as a Christian. Okay? Many Christians will stand there and watch a lot of their works get ground to dust. Some will watch it get broken, and some will watch their works get grounded to dust because they're mostly wood, hay, and stubble. There are going to be some Christians that stand up there before our Lord God Almighty at the judgment seat of Christ, and here's your penny. You know, when I first got saved, I thought that was such a blessing. Here's a penny, that I'd even get so much as a penny. But I was ignorant of Scripture. I started studying the Word of God. God started changing my life and told me, I'm not supposed to be one of those people that just has a penny. Here's your penny. I'm supposed to strive. Okay, I'm supposed to be thinking of things above, things that are internal, like the rewards in heaven. Things that are eternal. I'm supposed to be working to earn rewards in heaven, to do the work of the Lord. But there are Christians that are going to stand up there that have fallen flat on their face and they become a worthless Christian. They whine and complain. They want their rewards down here, so God's going to give them their rewards down here. They become part of the love of money. The love of money is the root of all evil, as some have coveted after. They have erred from the face and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's to Christians. The lost world, if that's the same way, but that's warnings to Christians. If you want your rewards down here, God will give you your rewards down here. You want the world down here and make a mess of your life? There's times where God will chastise you, chastise you, and then say, if you want the world, fine, you can have the world. The world, the way of the world is going to lead to death. 
premature death and God's going to bring you home early. But if you want these things, God's going to try to chastise you. He's going to try to say, hey, that's not what I want for you. This is what I want for you. What the Bible says. Okay. 1 John 4, 17. 1 John 4, 17. This is very important. 1 John 4, verse 17. Herein is love made perfect. Remember we talked about this. What are the two things you hide in your heart? that makes man perfect. Not the body of flesh, this wicked of flesh will never be perfect. But what are the two things you hide in your heart that allows man to be perfect? Remember 2 Timothy 2.15, Study, show thyself approved of God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly divided the word of truth. Um, the other one, uh, all scripture is given by inspiration, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Thoroughly first all, all good works. Thy word have I hid in my heart. This word right here is perfect. The King James Bible for English speaking people. The Bible I'm holding in my hands right now. God's per it's where you find the Holy Scriptures. Is in the Bible. It's where you find the Word of God. Okay? This book right here, God's Holy Scriptures, God's Holy Words, you hide them in your heart. That's how love is made perfect. The second thing you hide in your heart is Jesus Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is in you. And He's supposed to shine through you. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as He is, so are we in the world. Brothers and sisters in Christ, there are some of you that when you stand there at the judgment seat of Christ... You're going to think you can be bold, but God's going to bring you to your knees. And you're going to see a lot of works get burnt up because of your pride and your ego and your worldliness and your covetousness and false gods and you deciding to have sin for a season and deciding to turn your back on absolute truth. This says if you want boldness, here is the end of the love made perfect. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. True love for Jesus Christ is keeping his word, hiding in your heart, and living a life of Christ. And when you see people who don't want to live a life of Christ, they're not loving Jesus Christ, they're hating Jesus Christ. But they'll say, I'm saved. I've got my insurance card. i got my insurance card. But I'm saved. I've been given an insurance card. I'm saved. I'm sorry, I'm going to preach the gospel to you when you have that kind of attitude. It says, herein is our love made perfect. Our love for Jesus Christ made perfect through keeping His Word. Why? It's that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. We just read about that. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I'm talking about Christians. Every one of us will have to get an account of himself before God. Everyone, saved and lost, is going to have to give an account of himself before God. Brothers and sisters of Christ, if you are finding yourself in a fallen state, a worldliness, all the things I keep mentioning, uh, covetousness, which is idolatry, having idols in your life, you're letting sin back into your life, worldliness back in your life, if you've got a lot of pride, and have a proud look, you would do well to come back to the cross. Yes, you got saved. I'm not saying you're lost. You, but you'd do well to come back to the cross and remember why Jesus saved you, why He died for you, who He is, and whom it is you serve. That passion there, love made perfect. You need to humble yourself and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Remember me, O oh Lord. Remember me. And that's my plea. I'm not doing this to be like, I'm better than you. I'm no better than any of you. I've had to come before the cross several times to remind myself who it was that died for me, why he died for me, and who it is I serve. You think the world doesn't have the same pull on me that it does you? You think I'm, i got some special um, leeway that God has given just me and I don't have the same pull on me that you do, brothers and sisters in Christ? Oh, no. I come before the Lord every day. I come broken. Sometimes I get so tempted, i got to run out and start going for a walk. I have to get away from things that are tempting me. Mainly this computer over here. Okay? 
I go for a walk and I talk with God a lot. I start hiding God's word in my heart and he's gotten a lot of that filthiness out of my head. That's why the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. If you're not abstaining from all appearance of evil, how can God get that wickedness out of your head? And if you're not replacing that wickedness with goodness, God won't get that wickedness out of your head. But no matter how much you hide God's word in your heart, the Bible gives us a serious warning to abstain from all appearance of evil because those thoughts can always come back up. Out of the blue, your flesh can try to tempt you. The world can try to tempt you. Satan can try to tempt you. Remember the three enemies. Herein is our love made perfect. Are you doing your best to keep God's word? Are you getting prideful and puffed up? Are you above correction? Are you above accountability? Are you abusing the term, I love you brothers and sisters in Christ? You're using it just as a phrase that you say, but your actions say otherwise. Having grace for the brethren. Some brother, so I've noticed some brethren are misusing that word grace. I've had too much grace for that brother over the years. Uh, no, you didn't. You've forgotten what grace is. Some brethren have forgotten what charity is. Brother, this is the number one person I'm, I'm talking to. And then I'm pleading with my brothers and sisters of Christ out there, whether you hate me, or whether you love me, if you're truly saved and born again, this is my plea to you. That if you're in a fallen state, you need to get back up. Time is running out. Jesus could come back any day now. Don't let anybody steal your crown and tell you, no, nope, there is no imminent return of Jesus Christ. The Bible says we are supposed to be in this present world looking for that blessed hope. From Paul to today, every Christian is supposed to be looking for that blessed hope with the life you're living. If you believe Jesus could come back today, what are you getting done for the Lord today? Are you staying in His Word? Jesus could come back today. Are you going to get into sin and Jesus comes back and catches you in the middle of sin? No, you're going to be having fear of God. He could come back and catch me falling flat on my face. And there's been times I have been falling flat on my face in my life as a Christian. I look back, I thank the Lord He didn't come back there in those days. But he, if He was, He would have found me flat on my face. Calling me home in the middle of sin, wickedness, worldliness, pride, ego, all that stuff. Oh yeah. Brothers and sisters Christ, you need to believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ for the life you're living. And we see those who have turned their back on it, the life that they're living now. It's not the same. And I'm pleading with those brothers to get back to living for Jesus Christ every day. Seek His face every day. Humble yourself every day. Put down the flesh every day. You want to be able to uh, have boldness in the day of judgment? Herein is our love made perfect. Matthew 25, 21 says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Matthew 25, 23 says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Now, doctrinally, that's not for today. But here's the thing. How many of us want to hear Jesus Christ when we stand bold at the day of judgment, hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. There's still times, Lord, brother, says Christ, that I believe that I, I might be on my knees. I may be one of those people that just falls on his knees at the judgment seat of Christ. Because I've made some big, big mistakes in my life as a Christian. I have. Brethren, it's been brought to, I had someone mocking me saying, you just believe you're just so perfect, you just believe you're just so great and everything. Oh no, brothers of Christ, I have made some great mistakes in my life as a Christian. And I, I, I'm striving to be one of those people that can be bold on the day of judgment. I'm trying to hide God's word in my heart. I'm trying to get back to living right for the Lord and doing what's right. But there are days that when I fail the Lord, I just feel like I'm going to be one of those people that's flat on my face. And then there's days where I feel life that God's got my life really under control and doing the right thing. And the warning then is that I don't get too puffed up. Like, in other words, I'm in a place where I can be I can stand bold, not pride, pride's wrong. I can be bold in the day of judgment, but what seems to come in when I feel like I'm bold in the day of judgment is pride seems to come in. 
And you've got to be careful and kick that pride out. But don't mistake in boldness for pride, brother, sister of Christ. Don't mistake in that. When you see me bold, it's not because I'm prideful. I'm bold. God is. It's only by God's grace and God's mercy that He's gotten a lot of stuff out of my life. And in the future, when I win and if I fail Him again, I'm probably going to be back to the point where I feel like I'm going to fall flat on my face at the judgment seat of Christ. I seem to go back and forth sometimes. Some people seem to be over here and be bold most of their life. Some people seem to be over here like they're going to be flat on their face most of their life. And some bounce back and forth. My prayer is that we get most of us over here. Brothers and sisters of Christ, if you're falling flat on your face, God's faithful to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll forgive you, but you need to repent. You can't hold that sin in your heart. But we all long to hear that. Well done, that good and faithful one. Philippians 2.12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, well, I'm just doing it for him. I'm just doing it to be part of this club. I'm doing it to please my parents. Not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. When I'm over here on this side, I feel like I'm going to be falling flat on my face. That's where the fear and trembling comes in, and I need to work out my salvation. Am I living for Jesus Christ today? What's getting in the way of me living for Jesus Christ today? Worldliness? The flesh? Sins of the flesh? The Satan? Remember Satan's way? He's the king of the children of pride. And he's the father of lies. He's all about lies and deception and pride. Pride comes in, and because of your pride, you'll start lying. And you'll start deceiving yourself. You'll start deceiving those around you just so you can have your pride. When you're over here, where's the work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We need to have fear and trembling to get us back over here. Obeying God's word so that we may be bold in the day of judgment. And brothers and sisters Christ, loving your brothers and sister Christ according to the scriptures is very important. I've seen people use that just as a calling card, just something that they say. And brothers and sisters Christ, I know you can say the same thing about me because it's just a camera. That's why I keep pushing brothers and sisters Christ. We need to get back to physical fellowship. Seeing how each other lives physically. There's no account of, true accountability online. And brothers and sisters of Christ, some of you know that, and that's why you love online. That's why you don't want a house church. That's why you'll say you like a house church, but in deeds, there's no way you ever want to do a house church. Why? Because with a house church, there's real accountability. People are getting the, lazy. They're becoming what I call internet Christians. You know, you have your uh, Bible building Christians, your Sunday Christians. Well, you have your internet Christians. Be careful that you're not becoming like that. 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. Brother says Christ, that those that are fallen flat on their face that are truly saved. I lost it. Last well, time, going the wrong way. 1 Thessalonians 4. The Lord put it on my heart. We're just going to read the whole thing. Okay. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God. Remember what we were, were created to please God? So ye should abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you for, by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, every, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. The changed life, sanctification and honor. You're supposed to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You put the flesh down. Remember, Romans 8, you go from being carnally minded and walking after the flesh, that's a lost state, to being in saved state, being capital S spiritually minded and walking after the Spirit. It's only by the Holy Spirit of God and the power of the Gospel that I'm able to be standing over here sometimes to be bold. God's forgiveness, God's grace, God getting sin out of my life. So a lot of, uh, some of the people I keep coming across, sometimes you, fall into the, you, you catch yourself trying to justify sin. You need to stop that. 
You need to keep your body in check and stop let, stop letting your body rule you, run, uh, your flesh rule you, or the world rule you, the ways of the world, or, or Satan. Verse nine, uh, verse five. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avengers of all such as we also have forewarned you and testify. Brother says Christ, if you've wronged a brother in Christ, you do well to go make it right with them. If you believe a brother in Christ has wronged you, you do well to go try to make it right with that brother in Christ. Either way, you do well to go make it right with that brother in Christ. Avengers of all such. The Lord is avenger of all such. Once again, where's the fear of the Lord? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For God hath not called us into uncleanness, but unto holiness. God didn't save you so you can remain unclean. See, that's this false teaching of easy believism. God did not save you so you could be unclean. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore, he therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God. I've come across... We'll get into the false converts that say they love Jesus, they love Jesus, but when we talk about holiness and living a life of Christ, they get mad at us, they start hating us, they start running, this is my insurance card, but what they're really doing is they're hating God. They can say verbally, I love God, but with the life they're living, they're saying, I hate God. Therefore, that despise, there, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who also given unto us His Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. We, in action, remember, love, Jesus, if a man love, my, love me, he'll keep my words. Love is an action. It's not words. I can say I love you, brother and sister Christ, with words, but am I showing it with my actions? 10. And indeed ye do in... Do it towards all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we command you. The Lord blessed me with a garden. The Lord blessed me with going for walks. I have property here that i got to take care of. So, brother, says Christ, I've got property to take care of. I try to stay busy with my hands. I do Bible studies. The Lord's blessed me with being able to do some Bible teachings with you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to preach the gospel, to go out and gospel tract. But we're supposed to stay busy with our own hands as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly towards them that are without. The work with your hands needs to be good work, work that pleases God. Notice it says that ye walk honestly towards them. Oh, I'm sorry, back a little bit. And that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. And some, the work you do with your hands needs to please God. And if the work that you're doing with your hands is all fleshly about pleasing your flesh, then it's not some kind of work you should be doing. That ye may walk honestly towards them that are without the lost. They're supposed to see Jesus Christ in you. Remember, there's two types of way that you witness for Jesus Christ. There's a verbal testimony, and there's a living testimony. There's false converts out there that seem, they want to talk, 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 talk. I'm going to tell the gospel, I'm going to tell the gospel. But with their life, they're turning people away. With their life, they're creating false converts. Oh, is that what a Christian really is? Oh, if that's what a Christian is, I'd love to be a Christian. You mean I can continue in my sin and love the world and look like the world and act like the world? Well, sure. So you either end up creating a false convert when you don't have a living testimony and you're not a light for Jesus Christ, or you turn people away from wanting to get truly saved and born again. That ye may wake on, walk honestly with them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus Christ has died and rose again, even so them that are which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him the resurrection. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of our Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice 
with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be ever, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now stop. We got why do I keep reading? Brothers says Christ, we're supposed to be living the life of Christ. This talking about here. Keeping our body in subjection, living the life of Christ till God calls us home in death or He calls us home with the catching away of the body of Christ. We don't know when we'll be caught up in death. We don't know when we're going to be caught up in, with the catching away of the body of Christ. Body, soul, and spirit with a new body. We don't know. We're to live every day as if we could get caught up any day now. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. And no matter how hard for the ones that are still standing and they're having brethren that are fallen, turning against you, you know, spitting in your face, ripping your beard out, whipping you, <laughs> like they did Jesus Christ. Right? I'm sorry for that little laugh, but it's like a hysterical laugh, like, yeah, why are they doing it? Why would they do it? But they do it. Because you're standing, and they're not. And you're holding the Scriptures, them accountable to the Scriptures, and you're being a light that shines on their darkness that's in their life. Why? And those people that are down, you make a big mess of your life. That you're flat on your face. You make a mess of your life. You have one standing, and those that are flat on their face. Regardless what state you're in, brother and sister Christ, looking for that blessed hope, Verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. It's supposed to be a comfort. No matter how bad it gets down here, God's going to call us home someday, whether in death or in the cash away of the body of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man's sin be revealed the son of perdition. Brothers and sisters Christ, I cannot stop the falling away. God's word said it's going to happen. There is a falling away today before the catching up and that man of sin be revealed. There is a falling away today. And I can't stop it. Brothers and sisters Christ, you can't stop it. Right? But what I'm trying to do is to encourage as many brethren that will listen, that will listen. I have brethren that I love and care about are telling people, stay away from that man, he's going to mess you up. I'm trying to encourage as many brethren that will listen to not become part of the falling away. That's all I can do. I can try to slow it down maybe, or the falling away is going to happen. Maybe the Lord will bless some of us, brothers and sisters Christ, that we can encourage brethren that are in the fallen state to get back up to the standing state last minute before it's too late, to get back to that standing position. And we can encourage. That's my whole hope, brothers and sisters Christ. That is my hope. Whatever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. Your works at the judgment seat of Christ, how much of it's going to be broken and how much of it's going to be uh, ground to dust? If you've ever seen them, take, they take stone and when they melt it, it's almost like breaking the stone down to where it's liquid and then you can refashion it to the shape that you want. So it gets broken down and then it comes back as something great. Okay? That's what's happening at the judgment seat of Christ. Your works are getting taken and broken. and Some are getting broken and they come out with rewards. Some get ground to dust. How's your, how, may, how often, brothers and Christ, do you, do you sit there and think about the judgment seat of Christ? Or have you gotten so distracted by things of this world that you don't even think about it? Well, I think about it. Now my warning for those brothers and uh, sisters of Christ, that was my warning for you. Now my warning is for those who like to play Christian or flat out reject Jesus Christ. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Revelation 20. Revelation 20. Brothers and sisters of Christ, there's nothing in this world, for those who are saved, there's nothing in this world that's worth you losing so much rewards on him any rewards, period, at the judgment seat of Christ, there's nothing in this world that's worth it. No covetousness is worth it. No false idols are worth it. The flesh, sins of the flesh is worth it. No worldliness is worth it. No pride is worth it. You losing rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And the same thing with the lost world. There's nothing of this world that's worth you going to hell and burning and then tossing the lake of fire and burning for all eternity. 
There's nothing in this world that, that's worth preventing you from truly coming to the cross broken. Those professing Christians that love the world. The ones that God looks at and says, I never knew you. The ones He looks at and says, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Okay. Revelation 20. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. The Levitical laws, the laws of Moses, and it's another way they say it. And, and the Bible says it. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. You might think you're getting away with it right now just playing Christian. Those professing Christians out there that they're just so worldly, they love the easy believism because with easy believism, I can have the world and be a Christian. When you come to the cross, you forsake the world. When you come to the cross, you give up your so-called rights. The only God-given right we have, brother, sister, Christ, and that is to please God. We were created to please Him. Other than that, I, did you surrender all your rights at the foot of the cross? Your so-called rights? Oh, no, no, I, I have my own rights, I'm my own boss, nobody tells me what to do, and, and I, I can keep what I want and do what I want. What's going to happen? You're going to find out someday. We're going to find out to my brothers and sisters in Christ, and if any false con professing Christians are watching this, we're going to find out someday who was truly saved and who was lost at the catch away of the body of Christ. We're going to find out. And if you die, you're going to find out if you were truly saved or not. Why not get it figured out now? Stop being stubborn. Stop being prideful. Why won't you come to the cross broken? Matthew 25, 41 says, Then shall he say, unto, say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Remember the one thing that prevents people from getting saved? Worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow. Remember 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Once again, I'm not taking great joy in saying, hey, I don't believe you're saved. I don't take great joy in that. When I see that you look like the world, act like the world, you love the world, there is no new birth, there is no new creature, you show hate for God and His Word with the life that you're living. And your Word, oh, I love God's Word. But the life that you're living says, I hate God. I despise God. I despise His commandments. I'm going to preach the gospel to you, and I say that out of love. I want to see you get saved. You don't clean up your life to get saved. You come to God broken, and you throw that dirty, rotten life, that dirty, filthy rags, you throw it at the foot of the cross. Say, hey Lord, here's the old man. What do I do, Lord? What do I do? 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. A lot of brethren are leaving that part out. They're just saying how he was buried and rose again the third day. How what Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose the third day according to the Scriptures. You come broken and you say, Lord, save me. I can't save myself. I'm worthless. But if you never come to the, the Lord like that, Lord, I deserve to die. I deserve to die. I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you, Lord. You're my Creator. You're God. I deserve to die. Oh Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
Is there any way that I can avoid hell? Lord, please save me. Is there a way I can be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Brothers and sisters in Christ, professing Christians, that's what we went through, professing Christians, you have to come to God broken. Stop, you need to stop playing Christian. You might need to take this so-called insurance card and you need to rip it up and throw it away and say, God, I need the insurance here. I need to hide your word in my heart. I need you to save me so I can hide God's word in my heart. Lord, save me. I'm not doing this for insurance. I deserve to go to hell. Lord, save me. I believe in what your son, Jesus Christ, did for me. That it's God's blood that was shed on the cross. And it can wash my sins away. Please save me. Romans 10.9 says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. But with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. You tell God, Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, Lord. This body, it just I'm worthless, Lord. And I believe in your Son. That, he, that it was God manifest in the flesh. He was perfect. He was innocent. He died on that cross. I deserve to die on that cross. I'm one of those two thieves, Lord. I'm one of those two thieves. I deserve to die on the cross like that, Lord. But you don't. You did that for me. I believe that your blood can wash my sins away. Lord, please save me. And that's where we get to the last part, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, save me. You cannot skip any of those steps. You can't skip repentance and just have belief. You can't skip belief and just have repentance. Okay? You can't just say, God save me, and not have repentance or belief. You have to follow the plan of salvation that God has set in His Word. And the number one reason a lot of this is going to fall on deaf ears, okay, I, I pray this message doesn't fall on deaf ears, but I believe a, a lot of times it's going to fall on deaf ears because that pull of the world is stronger than your love for God and wanting to get saved. Your fear of hell, your, your repentance, your hate, your, you have more of a love for sin and love of the world than you do a hate of the world and a hate of sin. And this is going to fall on some deaf ears. But I pray that through this, somebody will get saved and say, you know what, I need to stop playing Christian and let God change my life and give me a new life after salvation. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We just read there in 1 Thessalonians, the whole chapter, 1 Thessalonians 4, where it talks about, you know, putting the flesh down and living the life of Christ. He could come back any day now. You could die any day now, and you're going to wind up in hell if you're a, one of those people that just flat out reject Jesus Christ, or you're one of those people that like to play Christian. I just like to play Christian. I like to play Christian. And I can keep pleading with all my heart, but I understand that some of this, most of this is going to fall on deaf ears. But I'm trying to reach that one person out there that's finally getting to the end of their ropes and saying, something's not right with my life. I keep justifying sin, loving sin. I've never really had a change in my life that you're talking about, Brother Philip. I've never had that change in my life. I, I, I just like I need to stop playing Christian. I need to get saved, and get saved, brothers. To become a brother and sister in Christ, get saved. Okay. But whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Do you want to go to hell and, and to the lake of fire to burn for all eternity? No. Do you want to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Yes. I gave you the steps on how to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to give up the world. Then you're going to go to hell and then the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. I don't say that with pleasure. I don't say that trying to get all happy about it. No. I don't want you to go to hell, brothers. Brother says Christ don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. People in hell don't want you to go to hell. I want to see you get saved and born again. 
Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm going to go back and I want to sing a couple more of those lines. Okay. Uh, Pass me, O gentle Savior. Uh, it's a good hymn. Pass me not. Remember me, O Lord, as I remember you. You fall on your knees, humble before God Almighty. And you say, I'm sorry, Lord. You humble yourself. You have sorrow in your heart. And this is to everyone, saved in a standing position, stay, saved that's fallen flat on the face, pretending Christian, you need to truly come to, get to the cross broken, pretending Christians. And those out there that flat out reject Jesus Christ, you need to come broken. Time's going to come where whew, the body of Christ is going to be gone. We're going. And if you get left behind, it's, uh, you're going to go through the worst time period ever, called the time of Jacob's trouble. Hell on earth. Hell is actually unleashed on earth. The bottomless pit. Right? You don't want to go through that time period. You don't want to walk out the door and get hit by a truck and wake up in hell, burning for all eternity, and you keep telling yourself, well, I, I was going to get saved, I was going to get saved, and now it's too late. You don't know when you're going to die, and you don't know when the catching away of the body of Christ is going to happen. Everyone needs to check their heart, and everyone needs to check their life. Those who are saved in a standing position, those who are saved and falling flat on your face, people professing to be saved. Yeah. Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face. Heal my wounded, broken spirit. Save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Thou the spring of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. I pray that you listen to this message, brothers and sisters in Christ, professing Christians, and if some lost person comes across this somehow. I pray for you, all of you, brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray for me in these last days. Okay? I do. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.